I'd like you to look at a passage of Scripture which is very well known to students of the Old Testament. I hope that you are uh, good students of the Old Testament. I would like you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. This particular passage, there is something said about people who arise with supernatural powers. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, gives you a sign or a wonder or a miracle, and the sign of the wonder comes to pass whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not listen unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave to him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God. Will you notice what the acid test is? Because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way. Notice again the emphasis that the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shall you put this evil away from the midst of thee. Now, apparently the Holy Spirit felt it important enough to expand upon this. And so there is additional counsel. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend which is as your own soul, entice you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely the gods of the people which are round about you, near to you, or far off from you, from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent to him, nor hearken to him, neither shalt thou pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal. But thou shalt surely execute him. Thy hand shall be first upon him to execute him. And afterwards the hand of all the people, thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he hath sought, notice the repetition of the same phrase, to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. There are three repetitions here. To lead you away, to thrust you away, to take you out of the path that the Lord commanded you to walk in. Now, we don't live in a theocracy today where God causes the execution of individuals under these circumstances. But going back in history, it is very clear that God's attitude toward those who appeared on the scene with supernatural gifts and then attempted to use those gifts to draw Israel away from the worship of God were worthy of death. That principle is worth noting simply because it is repeated in the Old Testament and it is carried over in the New Testament teaching to be aware of false doctrine and of false teachings. Now, in 1966, there were approximately 280 covens of witches in the United States. In 1971, there were more than 400 of them in the United States. In 1972, the London Times reminds us that there are more than 8,000 witches practicing in England. And that, of course, raises the question, what is a witch? And I think we ought to define some of our terms. A witch is a male or a female who utilizes occultic powers for good or evil ends. Hence the designation a white or a black witch. In effect, a witch is a medium who utilizes occultic phenomena or powers to bring about what they call good or evil. Anton LaVey, who is the founder of the First Church of Satan in San Francisco, has made a very succinct observation. I don't often quote a high priest of the cult of Satan but in this case, I will, because he's done his homework. LaVey has researched witchcraft in the United States and in Europe very thoroughly. 
And he has pointed this out, and it's worth noting. There is no such thing as a white witch. White witchcraft, says LeVay, is pure mythology. All witches are drawing upon occultic power. And that power does not originate with God. I think that this is a fairly good observation and one that we ought to keep in mind. Namely that God is the source of the power of goodness and Satan is the source of the power of evil. If you are not drawing your power from the Lord, it's rather apparent you're getting it from only one other source. Now you can call that source whatever you want. You can call it the elemental forces. You can call it magic. You can call it control over the elements or life. A rose by any other name will smell as sweet. But you are still drawing your power from a source other than God. And that is occultic power. Now the word occult, as I explained the other night, comes from the Latin occultus, which means what? The secret mysteries or the hidden things. And it has no part in Judaism or in Christianity. Now, if we're going to face witchcraft for what it is today, I think we had better understand that the practice of occultic or secret rites, which actually is what witchcraft is, spells and curses, etc., to attain one's own desired ends is never, ever connected with Christianity. It is never, ever connected with authorization from the Bible, from Judaism or Christianity, unless it is wrenched out of context and therefore has no real bearing on the subject. Witchcraft itself is nothing more than the practice of occultism. It is an attempt to manipulate forces to your own end. And there are people all over attempting it today. We don't know how many there are, but there are a lot of them. And I don't mean the kind that grace our television screens in The Wizard of Oz, with the pointed hats and the shoes and the broomsticks. I'm talking now about witches or mediums, as the Old Testament calls them, sorcerers, in the classic sense of the term. Now, should you think that covens are not multiplying, a coven is an assembly of from 10 to 13 witches, all you have to do is to survey California. We are told right now that in the state of California, there are more than 70 covens operating. I don't know where they're located, but I do know that they're operating. Now, most of them claim to be good witches and to be practicing witchcraft for good. But I invoke LeVay's rule, which is a very sound one. There is no evidence of anything in history known as white witchcraft. Witchcraft is witchcraft. And you are drawing upon occultic sources. You are certainly not drawing upon God. That's vitally important. And we see all about us the evidence of witchcraft in great popularity. The other day I happened to be speaking at the uh, Sunday school convention out in Chicago, which draws the largest number of people to it in the country, Chicagoland Sunday School Convention. And while I was there, I walked into the store, and there was a little book put out by that great occultic publishing house, the Dell Publishing Company. And along with their diet books and other things, from which we have all profited from time to time, <laughs> there was a little book that caught my eye, and it said, Everyday Witchcraft. 25 cents. Naturally, I was interested in everyday witchcraft, and so I purchased it. It was written by a lady who apparently knows what she's talking about because the material contained in it conforms to the literature of contemporary witchcraft. And the cover says, love, magic, charms, and spells, fortune-telling, everything you need know to enjoy occult Power. Now here's occultism for the masses. 
Witchcraft for the Millions, made easy. And you can buy it. And it gives you the essentials of sorcery. And as I read through it, I was struck by the fact that even in something as simple and rudimentary as this, and incidentally it's quite accurate, there appeared this statement, and I want to quote it, simply because it's a secular publication, not a religious one. Therefore, it has tremendous importance. Listen. Though you needn't be a witch to practice witchcraft, there are some witchy things you must do if you are to summon occult powers. Then it goes on to tell you the basic rules. Now notice how it begins. There are some witchy things you must do for what purpose? To summon occult powers. The opening gun of the pamphlet is an open admission of exactly what the principle of witchcraft is. Namely, you are summoning forces to do your bidding. Now in the Far East, everybody understands occultism. There are little spirit houses outside in Thailand and throughout all Asia where the spirits are cared for. Demonism is a common thing in the Eastern religions. It's only uncommon to us because we have not seen it in the raw. But we are going to see it as the forces of Satan burst out into the world. And they are bursting out onto the college campuses and into the churches and into our schools. I would draw also to your attention something else in this book. On page 31, there appears this interesting and, I think, very revealing statement. The statement says, Various malign influences are always loose in the atmosphere. No matter what you do or don't do, one day these forces may decide to focus on you or your family. However, when you start practicing witchcraft, the chances of drawing the attention of these mischief makers increases greatly. Close quote. That is one of the best statements I have ever heard of exactly what you are looking for. When you start reaching out for the unopened door of witchcraft and you turn the knob, what's coming through is a malign influence and there are great risks involved that you can ill afford to become involved with. Now, witchcraft is today very popular. Every day witchcraft for everybody. But there's danger in it. The State College at San Diego has at the present moment the distinction of granting a bachelor's degree in magic. I thought that's particularly interesting. And they are teaching courses at the present moment. One of the courses taught by a witch. University of California at Berkeley granted a bachelor's degree in magic to one man who is involved right now in the cult of Satan. If you pick up a telephone in Cleveland, Ohio, you've heard of Avis and you've heard of Hertz and you've heard of National and Dollar a Day. Rent a car. You may now rent a witch. That is correct. By simply calling Rent a Witch. For $25 to $200, you may have readings of tarot cards, fortune-telling, and even seances performed for you at your parties. So call up and rent a witch and have a metaphysical evening. The mass media has greatly assisted this. Rosemary's Baby, the Brotherhood of Satan, the Mark of Satan, the Brotherhood of the Bell, the motion picture, the devil, and multiple other ones are all aimed at one thing, interest in witchcraft and in Satanism. Bewitched, I dream of Jeannie, Nanny and the Professor, and Barnabas with his fangs showing in dark shadows, all aims at but one thing, the supernatural and witchcraft. And there are witches abounding in the scripts of dark shadows. There's even Barbara the Grey Witch. 
She's neither black nor white. She's gray. Depending, of course, I suppose, upon her motivation. You can get records of Barbara telling you how to practice witchcraft. Anton LaVey has also done some recordings of the Satanic Mass, a perversion of Christianity, and readings from his own Satanic Bible. Witchcraft is in, and popular, and powerful, and growing. It is in Europe, and it is spread to the United States and growing with astounding vitality. Ten years ago, the publications on the subject of witchcraft in Europe were minimal. Twenty years ago, almost non-existent except in occultic bookstores. Today, you can pick them up on almost any bookstore. The interest is there. People are reaching out for the unknown. Now, of course, the question must automatically present itself to any thinking person. Why witchcraft? What are the reasons that people reach out for this anyhow? There's got to be some reason. And then what does the Bible have to say about the whole thing? And what is the Christian attitude to be? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. Perhaps you'd like to jot them down and think about them. First of all, there can be no doubt that we are in the midst of a violent revolt against reason and logic. We see on every side today people who are acting contrary to reason and who have no relationship in their behavior patterns to logic. People kill other people just because they felt like they'd like to do that kind of thing. Are they mentally ill? They pass all the tests with flying colors. What's wrong with them? Well, they just felt like doing that thing then. And so they did it. Totally irrational. Totally illogical, but it's done. The great horror of the Manson killings is that there was underlying the entire thing a total irrationality. Why? What was the thing behind it, the meaning? What was derived from it? Nothing. In this revolt against reason and against logic, there has arisen an irrational kind of faith. People are reaching out for the irrational, the unreasonable, and the illogical. And witchcraft fits it beautifully. Why? Because it is irrational. It is unscientific. It is metaphysical. It certainly doesn't follow the four formal laws of logic. And it appeals to the mind that does not want to really think through the great issues of time and eternity. So number one, the revolt against reason and logic in our day. All about us, which has brought on the drug culture, which has brought on the absorption with alcohol, the absorption with sex. And now the absorption with death, which is rapidly replacing sex in our culture. People are becoming absorbed with the idea of death. Our leading magazines are telling us. This revolt against reason and logic has produced an irrational faith, an irrational way of life. Perfect ground for the seeds of witchcraft. And Satanism. After all, let's be reasonable. If God really exists, and I'm speaking philosophically and propositionally, if he really exists, who would want second best? If God really exists as creator of the universe and sovereign of all things, if you have hurts, who needs Avis? Who needs the devil? If you're really logical and rational. You see, we're living in an irrational mood. We are really not thinking. And that is why people are pouring into this type of reasoning. Secondly, there is a rejection of a church divided 
between orthodoxy and anarchy. And I want this to be very carefully understood. The Christian church is divided between orthodoxy and anarchy. Between liberal theologians that want to demythologize most of the substance of the Christian gospel and then remythologize it all over again and retain only its moral and its ethical values. Then there are the death of God theologians who want to bury the substance of the Christian gospel and preserve the embalmed corpse, which is the church, so that the church can continue to pay their salaries, which they haven't yet begun to earn. And the neo-Orthodox theologians, who want part of the substance of the gospel and part of the form of the gospel, with no real commitment to the authority of either. This is anarchy. No wonder people are confused. Between the modern theologians and the modern schools of theology, no wonder the man in the pew says, if this is Christianity, I'll have to take Coca-Cola. And he goes out someplace looking for something else. Now because of this, there is a rejection of a divided church. And here lies one of the greatest opportunities of evangelical Christianity. To present something to the world that the world desperately needs. An undivided Christ. An unchanged gospel. And a vital and dynamic witness. A living redeemer who can transform the lives of men and women and young people because he's alive. And because he has the power to do it. That is the response to the rejection of a church divided. And thirdly, there's a terrible influence of cultism in our country and our cultism. An influence of theosophy and spiritism and unity. And many of the eastern sects and cults, I Ching and Mirababa, Kao Dai, and others that have penetrated our culture. Hare Krishna groups are all over. In saffron robes complete with bowls, banging on their tambourines and chanting. No relation to reality. But there. And this has brought the East with all of its so-called mysticism into a homogenized form of Christianity. So that people are reaching out for an Eastern type of cultic Christianity lightly sprayed with biblical terminology. And they're buying it. That's the horror of it. Fourth, there's a desperate need on the part of individuals for purpose and meaning and order in a mechanistic and technocratic world where the individual has been largely forgotten and where corporate thinking and corporate structure has replaced the individual soul. Why are young people turning in the direction of witchcraft? They are turning in this direction because there's some individuality and some power they can get their hands on. And they don't feel as if they're beating their heads and their hands bloody against power structures that appear to care very little about anything except perpetuating themselves in power. This need for purpose, and meaning, and order in a mechanistic and technocratic society certainly is one of the primary reasons for a turn toward witchcraft. And then, fifth, there is tremendous progress that has been made in parapsychology, in the study and analysis of psychic phenomena, and in a world that 20 years ago people would have laughed at. 
But today it has a pseudo-scientific validation. And because of this, people are rushing into it because ESP, parapsychology, experiments with the occult have given status to the world of the occult and to the power of witchcraft. Otherwise, you wouldn't have them taught in schools unless there was some validity, some reality to it. And believe me, there is. Underneath it all, there is reality. Frightening reality. And sixth, people are fascinated by the unknown and challenged by any attempt to know the future and to control it. That's why they go for tarot cards. That's why they go for palm reading. That's why they go for astrology. That's why they reach into the world of the occult and that's why they go into witchcraft. They're fascinated by power and by its control. And they can reach out and know something about you and about the person next to you and the neighbor next door and they can exert authority and power. That's what witchcraft offers. And they're reaching for it. And finally... There just simply is reality in the world of the supernatural and in the world of the witches. It's there. And people have experienced it. And they are testifying to the validity of that experience. Because of it, people are interested. They are moving in the direction of witchcraft. And it's become popular, faddish, and very much the vogue. Now, in the face of all this, what does the Christian church have to say? Do we sit by and say, this is terrible, we simply have to do something about this one of these days? Or, do we satisfy ourselves by quoting a couple of Bible verses and then discontinue interest? Or do we learn the biblical position and then take some definitive action? I think the last must be our choice. So let's take our Bibles. How many of you brought them this evening? Good. Let's find out what God has to say on the subject of witchcraft. Because it makes very interesting reading. We have already seen God's attitude toward mediums. Towards those who play around with the future. And delve into supernatural things. The witches and those who practice witchcraft. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 18 for a moment. And see something a little bit further in the mind of God on this subject. Beginning at verse 9. The warning of God. When you have come into the land which the Lord thy God gives thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. You ought to circle the word abomination. Very strong word in the Hebrew. There shall not be found among you any one that makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That was a common practice of paganism, devil worship. Or that uses divination. Very, very common practice today. Attempting to find out something by supernatural means. Or an observer of times or an enchanter, or a witch. The word witch is the word medium. Exactly what it means. A medium. A charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits. That is a spirit that possesses the body of an animal and sometimes a person. Or a wizard, or a necromancer. That is somebody who is fascinated with the art of communicating with the dead. Now, I want you to look at verse 12. This is God's judgment on the people who practice these things. And he's covered the whole spectrum of witchcraft and the occult. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. What was God's view? He repeats it three times. You can't possibly fail to get the message. Abomination. 
Abomination, abomination. Don't do it. I drove out the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites. I gave you this glorious land of milk and honey. I have given you the land of Israel and drove out the people that lived here because they practiced these things. Don't you do it or out you go. Just recently I stood on the plains of Megiddo overlooking the biblical site of Armageddon. Beautiful valley of the Jezreel. Saw the glory of a land restored by the power of God. And as I was looking over Solomon's palace, the ruins of it, and the temple that he built there, I noticed that in the center of the temple, the steps went up, not facing Jerusalem, but away from it. And I went over to the guide and I said, I noticed that this altar doesn't face Jerusalem, but all altars to Jehovah face Jerusalem. He said, you're right. Solomon built this altar to a Canaanite deity to please one of his wives. King Solomon loved many strange women. And he built temples to their gods. Here is the remainder at Megiddo of a Canaanite sacrificial altar. With the step still facing the wrong way to remind you, when Solomon turned his step from God, God finished the Solomonic kingdom. If you will walk in my statutes, none will arise like you. If you depart from my statutes, said the Lord, everything leaves you. And in the end, he lost everything, including his wisdom. What a terrible reminder of what it cost the wisest man in the world. Because, though he did not worship other gods himself, he condoned it on the part of others. And God judged him for it. Think of your children. Think of your school system. Think of your responsibility. And think of Solomon. Don't condone something on the part of others. Do something that the Lord does not sit in judgment on us. There's a very clear picture here. God has very definite views. His views toward witchcraft are clear. Witches are mediums. They try and contact many of them. The world of the so-called dead. What they're really penetrating is the world of demons. And when we get to spiritism on Friday night, we're going to see just exactly how the only seance in the Bible ended in disaster. Simply because God intervened and did something about it. But the scripture is clear. Witchcraft is forbidden by God in Exodus 22:18. Thou shalt not permit a witch or a medium to survive. He ordered their execution. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination suggesting the Salem witch trials be reinstituted. I am not suggesting we pile up the green wood and hunt up the witches. I am suggesting the Christian church wake up to the fact that occultism and witchcraft is here. And we do something about it. That we understand the biblical position and we face it. And meet it in the power of the Holy Spirit. How did God meet it? Well, let's take a look in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul ran straight in to a male witch. How did he deal with him? Acts, the 13th chapter. Now, a lot of people don't like the Apostle Paul. That is, a lot of professing people in the Christian church because they think that the Apostle Paul was a little harsh at times. He was harsh when it was necessary. And in this instance, it was necessary. Notice what the scripture says. And when they were at Salimus, they preached the word of God, verse 5, in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John for their minister. And when they had gone through the island of Paphos, 
they found a certain sorcerer, translation of the word, medium, male witch, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Barjesus, which was in the company of the deputy of the country, or the one who had the authority to rule the country, Sardius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, that's the meaning of the word, that is his name by interpretation, withstood them. You will always find that witchcraft withstands the gospel. Always. I never found a friendly witch when you started talking about Jesus Christ. I never found a friendly witch when you started talking about salvation. I found witches who were very intellectual and highly educated and who liked to talk about Christianity and witchcraft and maintain that actually the Christians had the wrong slant on the witches and so did the Old Testament prophets and actually witches weren't really such bad people after all. But it's amazing when you get right down to the nitty gritty of who Jesus Christ is and what the Christian gospel is all about, they universally blow their cool, as the kids say it today, and they really get angry. Why? Because Christ stands in judgment over them. He's no medium. He's no witch. He is sovereign Lord of all. And they must obey Him. But they won't. For the source of their power is not Jesus Christ. The source of their power is the prince of darkness. That is why they will oppose him. Look what happened. Then Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what you have to have to deal with witches. The power of the Holy Spirit. Because this sorcerer was trying to turn this man from the gospel. And Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. He set his eyes on him and he said, I suggest that we sit down and have a theological orientation on this subject. <laughs> we have an ecumenical panel, which all of the pastors of the area decide whether or not the psychic phenomena which you have manifested is valid. And then find out whether it has any redeeming social or spiritual value to it. Then we will compare this with the message which we have received from the Lord and then decide whether or not we ought to continue with the dialogue. I'm so delighted that the apostles did not waste their time with the infernal claptrap that ties the church today. They knew precisely what to do when they were confronted with evil. They never found Jesus Christ's gospel negotiable. Never. Notice what they said. Oh, full of all subtlety and mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not stop perverting the right way of the Lord? I consider that to be a very direct approach to the matter. It is obvious that Paul was, in the classical sense of the term, orthodox. And now... Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You will be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell upon him a mist of darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by his hand. Then the deputy, Sergius Paulus, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit encounters witches, there's only one outcome. The witches come out on the short end of the broomstick. Every time. And the Christian has got to realize that. Oh, if we could only this evening realize the power that is at our disposal. If we could realize the authority that has been conferred upon us as the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he appears we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. What power God 
has placed in our hands and has commanded us to go into the world and confront evil with the authority of Christ. And when we confront it, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We need not fear the demons. We need not fear the witches. We need not fear the mediums and the sorcerers and the necromancers. We need not fear the occultists. We need only recognize the power that God has given the church. And if you don't have that power tonight, it isn't because God isn't willing to give it to you. It's because you haven't got down on your knees and cried out to God for it. And anybody that ever did, got it. And if we're going to be powerful for Christ, whether we're Methodists or Baptists or Congregationalists or Episcopalians or Lutherans or Quakers or whatever we're going to be, it's going to be because we open our minds and our hearts and our souls to Jesus Christ, He that baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And we receive power from Him in our lives so that we go out into the world and turn it upside down. That is why the first century Christians were triumphant. Because they had power as well as authority. And men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You see, when Paul encountered this, he knew how to deal with it. Why? Please notice what the text says. Verse 9. Then Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. The power of God in our lives. His Spirit. Moving in us and through us to touch others. I understand in Los Angeles, Hal Lindsey has a place called the Light and Power House. Jesus Christ's Light and Power House. Light because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And power because all power is His in heaven and earth. It's a pity that all that power is just sitting there. And Christians haven't learned to plug in yet. And receive that power to use in a world of spiritual darkness. Where we can blaze, illuminating the darkness with the light of the world. Paul rebuked evil in the name of Jesus Christ. And it retreated from him, so must we, in no uncertain terms. We recalled also Acts 16.16, 16, just briefly. How the young girl possessed by a demon went behind and said, This is the power of the gospel. This is the righteousness of God. These men are showing a way, a way of salvation. And what did Paul say? We covered this when we studied the doctrine of the demons. Paul said it wasn't necessary for Jesus Christ's gospel to be endorsed by the devil. Jesus Christ's gospel stood on its own without the devil's endorsement. And he commanded Satan to leave the girl alone. And she was freed. And Christ became Lord of her life. We are told in Galatians 5 verse 20. That witchcraft is listed as one of the works of the flesh. Now, the people who play with the Ouija boards and the people who fool with witches' games and spells and the people who dabble in it, let them take care. Galatians 5 says, This is one of the works of the flesh and it's listed among those things which are condemned by God. Those who practice them shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. We are warned against the practice of the works of the flesh. It's no accident that God chooses to remind us that witchcraft is one of them. Now it's impossible to talk about witchcraft without at the same time bringing together the concept of Satanism. Because witchcraft and Satanism... Go side by side. The power of Satan is the source of all witches. The source of all evil. To deal with it, we must first understand what it is. 
What actually is Satanism? Classic Satanism is the recognition of the devil as superior to God and worshiping him as the spiritual source of your authority. Classic Satanism is praying to him, seeking things from him, bargaining with him, and following the practices prescribed in satanic worship. Classic Satanism can only be described as devil worship. Whatever form it takes, that's what it really is. It's quite significant that the first church of Satan, founded by Anton LaVey, in describing Satanism, denies that the devil exists as a person. LaVey says that Satan is the evil within all of us. Satan is corporate evil, not individual evil. Satan must be exercised within you, not exorcised out of you. LaVey's basic principle of Satanism is that the devil does not exist as a person. But all evil is Satan. The position is philosophically weak and logically unsound. But it all ends up with the same thing. For LaVey practices Satan worship, even though he won't recognize Satan as a person. It's most significant in the study of Satanism to realize that it is actually the pursuit of and the worship of evil as a choice over good. Now I have, in my own research on the subject, Notice some interesting things about it. One of the things that I've noticed is that Anton LaVey has thoroughly condensed for us a vast amount of information about Satanism and put it in a very succinct way. And so I'd like to quote LaVey because I think he has done us a great service. He saved me a lot of money in that I don't have to buy a lot of extra Satanic literature. I just had to buy the Satanic Bible and a few other things, plus the vast amount of material which was already available that libraries had. But LaVey gives us the Satanic statement. And this is the epitome of Satanism historically. So listen to it. You've often wondered what Satanism believes? Here it is. One, Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Two, Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Three, Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Four, Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Five, Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Six, Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. Seven, Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who because of his divine spiritual and intellectual development has become the most vicious animal of all. Eight, Satan represents all of the so-called sins as they all lead to physical, mental, and emotional gratification. Nine, Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had as he has kept it in business all these years. Finally, LaVey on the subject of sex. Quite interesting in Satanism since a nude woman is frequently used as the altarpiece for satanic rituals. And since the Black Mass involves sexual orgies and things which need not be gone into at this particular point in our discussion. But Anton LaVey on sex and Satanism. Quote, Satanism condones any type of sexual activity which properly satisfies your individual desires, be it heterosexual, homosexual, Bisexual or even asexual, if you choose. 
Satanism also sanctions any fetish or deviation which will enhance your sex life. Adherence to the sensible and humanistic new morality of Satanism can and will evolve society, a society in which children can grow up healthy and without the devastating moral encumbrances of our existing sick society. Close quote. I thought it would be a good idea to just put Satanism in its proper perspective. What does it really represent? It represents, by its own definition, a series of negative propositions. I hope you noticed that. I don't know whether he intended it as such, but all through the ages, in everything that's written on the subject, it's all negation. The positive aspects of Satanism are always shrouded somewhere along the line in negation. You're to love others, but only the ones that deserve it. Who are the ones that deserve it? The ones that you think deserve it. Who are the ones that you think deserve it? The ones that love you. Quite obviously, the concept of love as being given without expecting return doesn't exist in the Satanic Bible. It exists only in the Christian Gospel. Everything that I have read is a negation of biblical theology and of Christian revelation. Now, I personally believe that Satanism will continue to grow because it has something going for it that everybody's interested in. Metaphysical, supernatural excitement combined with immoral behavior patterns. One of the things that interested me most about Satanism was a case that occurred right here in California. This was very carefully researched, and I thought that it would be a very good thing to include this case history of Satanism and its happy ending, so that we could see that the power of Satan does yield to the Christian gospel. A young man by the name of Mike Warnicke became a member of the cult of Satan. He passed through the various realms of satanic command and eventually became high priest and presided at the meetings of a satanic cult here in California whose membership rose from 500 to 1,500 members. There were three degrees, he said, of membership in his organization. I quote him now. The first involved private parties with little satanic overtones where minor rituals were really a prelude to orgies. Next, there were secondary rituals used on minor occasions for the binding together of members in fellowship. Sort of a Sunday go-to-meeting thing. These were held in warehouses. Finally, a barn or an orange grove was used where... An altar was constructed, and a ceremony similar to the Catholic High Mass was performed. On this stone altar, there were grooves to catch the flow of blood, and it stood before an inverted cross, which is the symbol of Satan. A goat head idol was also in evidence, and a devil's pentagram, which is the symbol of Satan. Spirits came at these particular conclaves, he reported. They were summoned up, and offerings were made to Satan. He said that they would call up three messengers or spirits at each of these rituals and send them to do some task. Some had as many as six messengers working for them and could call them up by name. I'm going to spare you the details of the blood sacrifices which were offered. But he points out that they imitated in the black mass the Christian act of communion. That there was actual flesh eaten and it was human flesh. And he went on to talk about the orgies that attended it. In one of these, and I'm quoting, a young girl had been kidnapped from the street and taken to one of the meetings. Placed upon the altar, she was going to be forced to submit to a certain number of men. 
The three master counselors, clad in their black robes and sitting on elevated tiers, heard her pleas for mercy. Then they had her hands broken when she refused to cooperate willingly with their wishes. Afterwards, she was tied to a block and brutally violated. Was taken to a physician then and her hands were set. The girl who was threatened by the Satanists, he goes on, was released but did not betray them. Warnicky goes on. About six weeks later, she calmly walked up to me and said, I love you. I thought she had gone crazy. But she went on to tell me that she had accepted the Lord and that she had forgiven me and all of us. I turned around and split. That really blew my mind. He went on from this experience haunted by the face of this girl who had been through the hell of Satanist oppression and had been the forgiving example of everything he said could never happen until driven to the last extreme on drugs and having lost everything he had a 38 pistol and one bullet and was writing his suicide note when drifting through the windows he heard Christian singing a hymn. He got so mad, he decided not to commit suicide, <laughs> to spite the Christians, and joined the Navy. <laughs> it was in the Navy that this high priest of Satan met two Christians who witnessed to him and took him to chapel. And he spent all his time knocking the chapel. And he notes that they sailed into him with the gospel. And they wouldn't let him up for air. They just stayed with him. With the power of Christ. And the time came when this high priest of Satan. Drug addict. Under withdrawal symptoms. Tortured. Tormented. Having lived a life of horror and perversion of unimaginable evils, came to the place where on his knees he received Jesus Christ as Savior and was born into the kingdom of God. Mike is now going out on the road witnessing to Satanists and occultists to tell them Jesus Christ is alive and if he can save me, he can save anybody. When you start talking about the power of Satan, never minimize the power of God. The risen Christ said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. Go, said God to Moses, my presence will go with you. There is power in the blood of Christ. There is power in the gospel. There is power in the spirit that lives within the temple of the believer. There is power to touch the lives of the witches, the warlocks, the Satanists. There is power that they fear and that their masters fear. And that Satan himself will flee from. For no force of evil in the universe is equal to the specter of a Christian on his knees. You and I have had the priceless privilege of exposure to the message of God's grace. And there has been committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We are commanded to go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And to bring that message of redemption to a lost age. Your task and mine is clear. The power to do it is ours. The opportunity to do it 
has arrived. The challenge, the time, everything has been presented to us. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all render an account of ourselves to God. May the Lord give us the wisdom and the grace to realize that the witches and those who are dominated by Satan are also souls for whom Jesus Christ died. And that they too, as in the case of Mike Warnicke, can pass out of the authority of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. This is the true God. This is life eternal.